2022 is an interesting year because a lot of the games this year that I was really looking forward to got pushed into next year. And next year now is looking so stacked, I don't even know where I'm going to find the time to play all these games, particularly when it comes to RPGs. And those are already longer games within the gaming sphere at large. So I don't even know what I'm going to do. But no, 2022, while I didn't get to play everything I wanted to this year, there were still some good games I was able to play, enough to make a top 10 list for anyway. So everybody, let's get to it. The top 10 best games for 2022. Euden Chronicle Rising. Of course, an Euden Chronicle title would be on this list. Just look at the amount of videos I've made for the series. But that aside, I still did enjoy it enough as a game to have it on the list. Does it have issues? Sure it does. The main story is okay. There is a lot of backtracking and a bunch of fetch quests too, but it saves itself with charm. The main cast of CJ, Guru, and Isha are endearing. The supporting cast are colorful and interesting as well. The combat, while simple, had enough variety to it to keep me engaged throughout. And the bright colors Euden Chronicle Rising uses complemented the rich backgrounds to breathe life into all the game's areas. I would have a hard time recommending it to people who aren't invested in the upcoming sequel game Euden Chronicle 100 Heroes, but if you do try it, you might find it to be a nice little gem. Horizon Forbidden West is a good open world game. It's not a great game though. I would hesitate to call it that even though it does have its moments. It just felt like more of the same when it comes to the open world genre. And that really is its biggest problem. This game continues Aloy's search for answers in a post-apocalyptic world filled with robot animals and warring clans. Visually, the game is stellar, both in and out of combat, with good music and voice talent to match. The combat is very similar to the first game, but with some nice new additions, and the combat at times is really exciting particularly against some of the more ferocious enemies with really good AI. There are a few other things though that hold it back. The narrative definitely loses steam after a certain point. It's the open world game that broke the camel's back. I just got bored of too many so-so side quests and uninteresting dialogue and hunting down map icons. I don't have the unlimited patience for it that I once did. That being said, I can still recognize it as a good title. It unluckily was just one open world game too many for me. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. F yeah, as soon as I saw this game, as soon as I saw it revealed, I needed it. The nostalgia bait was too too powerful to resist. And lucky for me, the game was awesome. Tribute Games, the developer, pulled out all the stops for this turtle adventure. An incredible animated opening, fine-tuned beat-em-up gameplay, good music, and a ton of villains to fight across many levels. The game was quite long for a beat-em-up, which was great. The biggest issue though, the multiplayer friggin' sucks. You get more than two, maybe three characters on screen, it's total chaos. Especially if you are using all the turtle characters. Good luck keeping track of who you are. But I preferred to play it alone anyway, so good thing going solo was a good time. And it's probably the best way to play this game anyway. Back to speaking about open world games that broke me, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. I played this game for 140 hours, and the experience of the first 70 hours versus the last 70 hours was very different, so stay with me. The first 70 hours, awesome, loved it. This Xenoblade game was going for a mature storyline, darker themes, the main cast all had sick designs, all were immediately likable, except for one. The lighting and shading effects combined with the more mature designs made the cell shaded style really pop. The music was metal. The story had me intrigued and I was enjoying the extra character development via side quests. 
and battles were complicated with a cool job system. Ugh. So what the hell happened? Too much of a good thing apparently? In a nutshell, I got bored. The game allows you to get overleveled far too easily, erasing any semblance of challenge and erasing the diversity of the job system as a result by making your choice of jobs much more meaningless. Not to mention a lot of jobs give you a half-assed costume change too, which really did take away some of its fun. And the story unfortunately lost a lot of momentum between story beats, as the side contents didn't do enough to keep me engaged in the world itself. I should have powered through to the finish line after I started getting burnt out. Lesson learned, I will not play a game again like I did this one after I start feeling that burnt out. But still, a great 70 hours is a lot of value, even if the last 70 were not. It's still a good game. It just wasn't able to keep me engaged enough via gameplay or story to keep me invested. Live Alive, now we're getting to the good stuff. Square Enix, what the hell? You have games this good still that never made it out of Japan? Whatever else you're hiding, if it's this good, I want it. I almost have no complaints about Live Alive. It's got the gorgeous HD 2D visuals, one of the best boss themes ever, and an engaging game format where eight unique characters have their own separate stories and conflicts that unite in a delightful twist. I will never forget Live Alive's story because of how charming it was and the fact that every single chapter never overstayed its welcome. If I had to complain, I guess I could say it's a bit easy, but the turn-based combat with its grid-based movement system kept my attention the whole game. With its flashy combat that was pure eye candy, Live Alive is a must play for old school RPG lovers. The Last of Us Part 1. This was a pure impulse purchase. I haven't played The Last of Us since it first came out for the PlayStation 3 and I still consider it one of my most favorite franchises of all time. You know a remake or remaster is visually good when it matches your rose-tinted nostalgia. The game has the same compelling and memorable characters I remember with the same great story. I loved this game so much that it made me go back and play all the Naughty Dog games I hadn't played before because I was craving anything with similar DNA to The Last of Us I could get my hands on. Though I have yet to play anything that matches it in terms of its brutality and willingness to make its characters suffer, which really did mess with my emotions as the game also did its job in making me care about everybody so damn much. I guess there's something to be said when it comes to fathers or father figures going on adventures with their kids. If done right, it makes for a very compelling narrative. This game and The Last of Us prove that. Kratos in particular has had quite the drastic character arc. From rage-filled, revenge-focused asshole to benevolent god and caring father. God of War Ragnarok is a satisfying conclusion to Kratos' Norse arc. And the narrative is matched with the same fun, over-the-top action gameplay God of War is known for. I loved the fact that this game was not open world. I liked the more focused narrative and gameplay segments. Sure, there were some decent sized areas and some exploration, but the action, combat, and story were where the focus lied, and I wouldn't ever change that with the God of War games. I can't say for sure God of War will never go open world. I just hope the developers don't forget what worked for them in the past, and the games find different ways to grow and change compared to all the other open world games out there. Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker isn't quite as good as Shadowbringers was, but damn it, it got pretty close. Final Fantasy XIV is still the best mainline numbered Final Fantasy since 10, and is the perfect game for people who want a single player MMO experience. More and more of the game is being made single player friendly all the time, but if you actually want to talk to and get to know the people you're playing with, it has one of the best gaming communities out there. In all my time playing it, I've met like one asshole, and that's after years of playing. 
the music, story, and gameplay have all either gotten better or largely maintains their quality with every expansion. It has never had a significant dip in quality yet. The graphics haven't changed, but they still have a ton of charm, and the part I care the least about anyway. And with the main story arc now over and a new one set to begin, exciting times are ahead. Elden Ring. If I didn't get a dream game this year that I didn't know I was even waiting for, this game would be number one. Of the three open world games I played this year, Elden Ring was the only one that didn't burn me out. Even though it lacked a really solid main narrative, the world it crafted was still better than anything else released in 2022. And a lot of open world games really suffer with delivering a really good main narrative anyway. So it was probably for the better. I loved slowly peeling back the layers of Elden Ring's world when it came to its lore. And its environments kicked the crap out of anything else out there. No one else does haunting and beautiful like From Software does. And the enemy bosses, forget about it. Some of them were nothing short of exhilarating. And with the different classes, weapon types, spells, and abilities at the player's disposal, the replay value is really high. Which is more than I can say for a lot of open world games. Most of them are one and done for me, whereas I would dive into Elden Ring again. Since Final Fantasy Tactics released in 1997, I've been waiting for another experience of a similar pedigree. While Triangle Strategy is not Final Fantasy Tactics, nothing will be, it was my definitive gaming experience in 2022. It's a great tactical role-playing game with its own identity. It focuses on gray narrative decisions versus the so often clear-cut black and white that we see in many games. And these decisions through the journey result in different routes that provide a ton of replay value. I know I'm really enjoying a game when I immediately have to replay it again as soon as I'm done. And Triangle Strategy gave me one of the best new game plus experiences I've ever had with a game. The balance and challenge of combat was the best I have ever experienced in a tactical role-playing game. And this is specifically because the game does not have a job system. While it's missed, its absence undoubtedly results in a much more balanced and challenging gameplay experience. As the developers were able to plan every map, to the minute detail as the player will have very specific units and abilities available to them to conquer the developer's challenges. It's a new pillar for tactical role-playing games and is hopefully leading the charge to the revitalization of this for far too long absent subgenre. Now if you'll excuse me, there's even more 2022 games I haven't played yet, so peace. 